क्यों शुभ किया That was part of the opening scene from our piece called Anerka, a play about the collision of cultures set in the Arctic. Now, if I asked you, what did you see, I expect we would get a variety of responses. A shaman performing a ritual. Uh, an Eskimo holding a stone to her chest. Someone watching geese fly overhead. A woman praying. An object that seems to be alive and thinking and feeling. We work with puppets, and puppets work with your imaginations. They're not alive, you know they're not alive, and yet somehow they manage to evoke a sense of life. Puppets are iconic by nature. They're boiled down essences of life. And they scared the daylights out of me as a kid. <laughs> I have a vivid memory of the day I stopped being just afraid of puppets. I was in the storeroom of the Alba Trull Puppet Theater in Liège, Belgium, sandwiched between floor-to-ceiling racks of 100-year-old puppet archetypes, demons and princesses, ghouls, simpletons, kings and queens, all staring at me at very close range. <laughs> and I felt this primal fear stirring up in my stomach. And I thought, I kind of like this. <laughs> <laughs> that childhood epiphany came to John two years after he had quit law school. <laughs> and I had left my uh, job as a theater professor and we'd formed figures of speech theater. We, we wanted to create whole worlds from scratch by finding new ways of working with puppets and actors, movement and music, mask and shadow. And ultimately, metaphor. I only realized this later, but I think what scared me as a kid was the puppets I had seen with their kind of jerky movement and staring eyes seemed like mockeries of life. They were like metaphors for life's primal carnality. I think John's I kind of like this moment was a realization that we could tap into that power of the puppet and choose what we wanted to do with it. The metaphor might be carnal, as John said, or we might be portraying material that was environmental by nature or spiritual or psychological. There are two schools of thought in the puppet world. One holds that the puppet is just a tool an instrument, like a violin, a means through which I, as an artist, express myself. The other school says that puppets are vessels, objects waiting for the spirit that wants to reside in them, a spirit that's out there in the ether somewhere. And then my job as an animator is to get my ego into the back seat and allow that spirit to pass through me as cleanly as possible and enter the body of the puppet. We are like way far into the second camp. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, animating a puppet on stage feels like meditation. In rehearsal, we spend a lot of time listening to our puppets, trusting that they know how they want to be in the world. 
This character, for instance, has her own sense of time, as you probably noticed. So when we work with her, we're asking you, as the audience, to go with us to a place where time has slowed way down. For me, as a performer, it's like the moment she comes to life, I just cease to exist. I'm gone. And yet, in some way, I am more myself at that moment than I am in day-to-day -day life. Our work has always been an exploration of how different forms on stage, puppets, actors, movement, mask, can be layered to express complex ideas without having to yakety yak about them. Um, the woman in Anerka, for example, is a metaphoric embodiment of a culture that is not our own. So our presence behind her, completely visible to the audience, is a quiet way of saying, this is not a documentary or a diorama. This is a creation drawn from our imaginations. Once upon a time, John and I were reading a bedtime story to our daughters. It was a Comanche story about a girl named She Who Loves who saves her village from drought. The story really resonated with us, so we took it with us when we all headed off on a wonderful fellowship to Japan with the Japan America Friendship Commission. The, we went there to learn more about different Japanese theater forms, the, um, especially the masked drama called No and the traditional puppetry form called Bunraku. And then, oddly enough, a concept for staging this Comanche Indian legend inspired by No and Bunraku began to take shape in our heads. This is She Who Loves. In the original story, both of She Who Loves' parents have already perished in the drought. And all she has left in the world is the buckskin doll they made for her before they died. Now in no drama, being dead is no impediment to getting a great role. <laughs> in fact, no is filled with ghosts. So we decided that we would make the ghost of She Who Loves Mother a central character in the performance. Here's a fragment from that performance. A moment in which she who loves mother comes to visit her daughter asleep for one last time. I am the ghost of the mother. In autumn, seeking the radiant light, she goes to the moon viewing spots, making her mountain rounds. Scenes from the past come to mind as if present. A husband. A village. A horse. A child. The anguish of parting from my daughter brings me to this place where I drew my last breath. The past, though remembered, 
does not return. There is nothing we can hold in this world. This I know. Like thistle down, we can only let go. What will become of my beloved child? She says. Or seems to say. And then, like a flame flickering out, she disappears. asking ourselves, why use a puppet in this scene, in this play? What can a puppet do here that an actor or a mask or a shadow wouldn't do better? The ghost of the mother is an ephemeral being, so her body has no substance. But then using my hand for her hand says that she's not entirely gone. She's still partly of this world. And then the face is more of a mask that's just gently held in place and then can be simply let go. Now, I can't physically do that as an actor, but the puppet can. So in every moment of performance, we're using the very forms we work with to pack meaning into the scene, to expand the audience's experience of this moment on the stage into something larger, something metaphoric. And. Uh, Speaking of larger, <laughs> using puppets also gives us the opportunity to work in whatever scale will enhance the meaning of the material. For Portland Symphony Orchestra's car uh, Christmas Carol, we created the three spirits of Christmas, past, present, and future. This is the spirit of Christmas past, performed here by our partner Ian Bannon. She's from another realm, or maybe she's a projection of Scrooge's mind, a hallucination or a transmogrified memory. So simply portraying her in this form as a puppet on this scale lifts that character out of the everyday, ordinary world and into the extraordinary world. Also, she's magic. Scrooge can touch the hem of her dress and be transported through time to scenes of his youth. Which is huge, right? I mean, it, that's huge, and it's also <laughs> delicate, and it's magical, and that is the realm of the puppet. We'd like to conclude by returning to the woman from America to illustrate one of the most remarkable qualities of the puppet, which is its ability to suggest transcendent realities. I'm going to narrate through what would otherwise be a silent scene to give you a kind of inside the head of the puppeteer perspective on this. Towards the end of Anerica, the shaman woman decides, for very complex reasons, to take her own life by freezing. Since she is a puppet, she's dependent upon us to help her which we do by removing her parka. Now, by this point in the performance, the audience is pretty totally committed to the idea that she is alive. I surrender to her will. I'm no longer manipulating her but rather watching her from a great distance as she moves away from life. With a minute gesture, she draws our attention to the fact that she is made of wood and cloth 
and string. If an actor were to remove his own skin to show us what lies below, it would have much the same effect. Suddenly, we, as audience, as witnesses, have to grapple with the sudden realization that she is just stuff. And yet she lives trembling on the edge of her own extinction. And if she is just stuff, what are we made of, really? What spark animates our beings and holds us in light? Then she stands and moves away from the rocks that have anchored her metaphorically to the earth and begins the process of dying. The poignant, painful, slow moment of looking upon the world for the last time. Until the final moment the final metaphor, when the hand of the animator separates from her body. And she is gone. Thank you.